And welcome to episode number 37 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. How are you doing this afternoon, Shane? I am pretty good. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Um, so we're two amateur astronomers, and these are our conversations on actually doing astronomy, which we were just discussing between uh, episode 36 and starting 37. Um, many other podcasts actually don't talk that much about um, or people are, are uh, more perhaps superficially interested in the actual uh, visual observing of the night sky, it's just sort of a, a passing thing. Um, and mostly a lot of the other podcasts tend to talk a little bit more about the astrophysics, which you and I don't, at least I don't know very much about astrophysics at all whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, me, me either. And I think, you know, at work when when people find out I, that I'm into astronomy, they'll ask me questions about the, like more of the astrophysics side of, of the hobby. And I just tell them, sorry, yeah, you're going to have to go ask Google. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm always asked about black holes and I'm like, I, yeah, I can't explain a black hole very well at all. <laughs> other than, other than a lot of my um, misappropriated time as a youth. Um, yeah, so we, we actually, uh, do astronomy and we, uh, we do enjoy talking about it. And these are really just our conversations on that. Um, but I actually, uh, do some astronomy writing <laughs> as well, even though I'm not, uh, astrophysicist, nor am I, uh, any sort of real professional writer. I, I, I do have, uh, degrees in writing, so. Might as well put them to, to good use. So one of the things that I do is I write uh, what's called the feature for the Royal Astronomical Society Observer's Handbook, uh, which is a handbook you can buy from, actually we have an American edition and a, a international edition or a Canadian edition. And uh, you can buy it, I think like Sky and Telescope, Astronomy Magazine. Um, I think it's on Amazon too. Amazon. Yeah, you can buy it from a whole variety of places. And they're really, I always wanted to write for the Observer's Handbook ever since I, I heard of it and I, and I got my first um, free copy. Um, when I joined the RISC, they gave me a copy and, and very unceremoniously ripped the cover off because they have to have it damaged in some way or <laughs> whatever. But uh, it's got a lot of really good basic information. Um, but uh, like many other people, I would complain that the information didn't change that much from year to year. And there, there's been a few other people uh, since that time, you know, some 20 years ago now, um, that also felt the same. So one thing that I started doing about eight years ago is offering my services to create dynamic information, but actually taking um, some of that uh, sort of quote unquote static information and actually bringing it to life. Um, through uh, like a feature constellation or region of the sky. Um, so in the past, I've done like the Milky Way, I've done Origa constellation, um, and a uh, few other things like that. Uh, so this year, I did uh, Scorpius the Scorpion. So Shane, have you ever observed Scorpius the Scorpion? I have. Um... <laughs> Mostly just for my Messier certificate. There's a few Messier objects in there that you need to get all 110. And that's kind of been the extent of Scorpius. Um, however, this year I wanted to dig more into that constellation. There's, um, well, in one of our podcasts, I talked about um, uh, one of my observing projects being observing the items that, um, why can't I think of his name right now? We love him as an astronomer and a writer, hidden David gems Levy? author. David Levy. David Levy wrote the gems. Uh, hidden gems? No, oh, O'Meara. Stephen O'Meara. Sorry, yeah, I, just, I just heard gems there. And we have the deep sky gems in the right, uh, right. In handbook. So. Um, yeah, I drew a complete blank there. That's uh, okay. But we, anyway. But this uh, is, these episodes, and I, I say this a lot, but it is true. These are unscripted. Um, a lot of the time, or they have very scant notes. This one, I think, has no notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he, Omira has a number of Scorpius objects listed in that book, so I was going to tackle those this summer if we ever get to a dark site. So, and that, that might be challenging. So I think we'll just, um, we'll just talk about this in, in very general terms. But 
you're going to be challenged by that chain because mm-hmm. Scorpius is, if you're really going to dig into it, it's still in the night sky. Now, for people that are further south, so if somebody is south of around about 41, 42 degrees uh, latitude, um, they, can, they can definitely uh, get into Scorpius and do some, some good observing. Um, for those of us that are north of that, it could be a little bit more challenging once we get past about the, uh, the second week of June or so, unfortunately. So if you're going to yeah. dive in there, you're, you're best to plan ahead. So planned for 2021 is what you're telling me. <laughs> yeah. So the reason why I did Scorpius this year is because usually what I do is I, is I, is I go out in May and, and sometimes April, uh, but, but typically in May and you'll often join me for the session and I'll figure out what constellation I'm going to do based on what's up and I'll do some initial observing and then I'll come back and, and observe it on, uh, on some subsequent nights. But this year, because of the pandemic, we weren't able to get out. But over the past five years, five years, something like that, maybe four years, um, I guess the past four years, I did a lot of observing uh, in Scorpius because I was able to get further south. Um, And there was a lot of stuff in there that that, uh, I wanted to look at. It's a little bit more challenging up here, around 50 degrees latitude. So I did all these Scorpius sessions just because I wanted to. <laughs> and, and I made a lot of sketches and notes. And so this year when it came to do an article, I thought, well, I could do this or I could do that. And then I was like, why don't I use all this Scorpius material that I already have and sort of put it together loosely based on that. So, so that's what I did this year, um, sort of an amalgamation of the past more or less four years of observing um, you know, a few nights a year in, in Scorpius when I can get further south. And then uh, also I'd made some observations about uh, 20 odd years ago, or maybe a little bit longer. And, uh, and it did include one of those. So Scorpius, it's actually one of the oldest constellations predating even uh, Ptolemy, uh, who, who wrote in his El- Elgemast in, in around 130 um, AD mark. Um, but uh, it, it actually appears in the oldest of the astronomical works. Do you know what the oldest, the oldest real astronomical work is, Shane, uh, that's actually been properly documented as a, as a true astronomical text? No, no, I don't. In my mind, this, this is very important. Like, I really enjoy the history of astronomy, too, and, and sit on uh, the National History Committee as well, but uh, infrequently spoken about in that, too. But uh, it's called the Mull Appen. And uh, this is a Sumerian text. Um, they found it, I, I think, I, I forget what city, but I believe it was uh, in Iraq somewhere. And this dates to around the 12th century uh, BCE. And it actually contains uh, Scorpius, the scorpion, uh, in that. And it was an important constellation back then because it marked the autumnal equinox. And this was a, uh, a catalog um, which was very critical uh, in the 12th century uh, BCE because uh, the agrarian cultures at, at the time would have relied on the, the stars and the planets a little bit more than we do now uh, for the planting and harvesting and such of, of crops. So unfortunately, though, um, for us at 50 degrees north latitude, where we grow a lot of crops here, um, we only see about 80% of the constellation. And, uh, and it's unfortunate. I'll talk about it later on because one of the most amazing things to see in the nighttime sky, we, we don't quite get from here, Shane. Unfortunately, you need to get south of 45 to see it. Darn. darn. It is kind of a bit of a darn thing, but uh, maybe we'll start. You mentioned uh, a little bit of mythology that, that we can... Uh, maybe we should talk about when we do a focus on a constellation or I think I'm calling these like a deep dive that we're going to do. You suggest that we do, we do 30 of these. Well, start starting. I, I think there's 30 official Northern hemisphere constellations, but okay. there's far more visible from the Northern hemisphere, you know, cause okay. some of the, you know, kind of equatorial ones or what have you, we, we can see portions of it like Scorpius. Yeah. I think there's 56 we can see from Saskatchewan, but yeah. I think, I think, 
I think what we should do is we should do 50 podcasts over the next five years on these. <laughs> I think I'm I could sure. do, I think I could do one a month and that would take five, I think it would take like five years to do somewhere in the, in the fifties. I think, yeah. I think that would be a, a good number for us. To well, you know, and little sidebar here, why, why I'm kind of fascinated by doing some deep dives into one particular constellation is a, you learn a little bit about the history, which I do enjoy. I'm not as passionate about it as you are, but I really enjoy hearing about it and, and learning about it. Um, but from an observational perspective, the most efficient thing you can do when you're out is to pick one constellation and stay there the whole night and look at all sorts of objects in there. If you're slewing across the sky to different constellations, um, you're going to spend some time just adjusting the position of your chair and yeah. you know, diagonal uh, angle, all this kind of stuff. Um, but if you just stick to one constellation, I just think that's the best night you can have. It's so enjoyable that way um, and so much more efficient. It's yeah. just a, a nice way to do things. Yeah, you can kind of get things a little bit more optimized. And, and we've, we've done this before. You and I yep. and Mike and, and Rick and others uh, have done like whole sessions together uh, in the dark skies, uh, just looking at, at one constellation. And again, it does, it does allow for that focus. Um, the best time to observe Scorpius, though, is in the spring, in my opinion. Um, and I looked it up. I forget. I saw some source said that the very best night to observe it is the last day of May. I don't think so. That's just, I think, when Antares culminates or something like that. I think the best time to observe it uh, is any time kind of in, in April uh, up to about the last day of May because you're able to get out and you're getting it as it's culminating. And, and I guess after, after that point in May, you're, you're maybe uh, still able to, to get it in, in June and maybe even the first part of July. Uh, but really by that point in time, it's, it's kind of starting to, to wane a bit. And your nights are so limited. Like I, I always like to kind of plan far enough ahead that if I don't get it then, and I'm really pushing for something, then uh, maybe I have uh, some wiggle room on subsequent nights. But, but if you do just aim for that end of May, uh, June or July time frame, I think you're, you're, you're really, really threading a, a fine line and might not get your observations in. So uh, I would say plan for that. Cause you know, April is coming. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, uh, you're right. Uh, I, sometimes I blink and it seems like, you know, I've lost another year or so. Yeah. Yeah. We, we got to talk about that later. Um, <laughs> but for those that are a little bit further south or those that are kind of just getting into it, it, it can be good just to, uh, to take, take a look at the Scorpion. Now it's still fairly high in the August sky. You can see Antares, which is, uh, the brightest star in Antares is sometimes referred to as the uh, rival of Mars, and it's among the 50 brightest stars in the nighttime sky. And, uh, and it's also a double. But I should mention the, the, the Greek mythology. I'm not that into Greek mythology. Um, it's not really my background. Um, and there's a lot of other really interesting um, connections from a variety of different cultures uh, with the night sky. Uh, but sort of off the top, I can't think of one uh, for uh, Scorpius. Uh, but I know like Wilfred Buck over at the uh, Indigenous uh, Resource Center over near Winnipeg, um, he's done a whole set on the Cree uh, constellations uh, and some of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the cultural heritage uh, from a Cree perspective, which is really awesome. Uh, Wilfred Buck is also a pretty darn good amateur astronomer too, and I've had the pleasure of, of, of observing with him a few times. So. Uh, tells a great story about going between sessions somewhere and getting out of his car in like minus 30 conditions and uh, locking the, the keys inside the car. Uh, good story. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so in Greek mythology, though, uh, the scorpion was sent to sting the vulnerable yet boastful Orion hunter. And after a, a brief battle, uh, where I think they both end up perishing, or, or more or less, uh, Zeus placed the pair into the night sky so that Orion hunts during the winter. Uh, but then in the summer, he kind of runs away when the scorpion uh, begins to, to hunt him. Um, and from our latitude, from 50, you will never get the scorpion and Orion in the sky at the same time. But if you go far enough south, uh, I think like maybe around 25 or 30 degrees latitude, you will be able to 
to see Orion rising as as the Scorpion is setting, uh, and and the Scorpion rising as Orion setting in in the spring. So, so there is that opportunity. Once the borders open again, Shane, if they if they open again soon, maybe we'll do a run down to uh, to the more southerly climates and maybe do some observing with our friends to the south. Yeah, we definitely have to do that when when circumstances allow it, whether it's this year or in, in the future at some point. Yeah, like I've never, I've been to the States quite a few times, as you know, but and lived there briefly. Um, oddly, I've never gone to the States from this province that I've lived in for 10 years uh, over the border driving. I, I've you know, flown down there a few times, but uh, sort of oddly, I've never just driven down. And I think there's some really great spots to do astronomy in Montana um, and, and in through uh, Ohio and some other places that, that are within like a day's drive or so. I think I even scouted some out and sent them to you last fall. I really had hoped uh, to get down. I hear some really great things about like the Nebraska Star Party and um, read a lot of, of uh, observing reports from people down there. So it seems like uh, some great folks uh, down in that area, which I've never been to. And, and I think that would be really fun. Um, but let's see. So Antares. Antares is one of the brightest stars in the sky. And it has a 5.5 magnitude companion. Have you ever split Antares? I have not. Uh, but I will try one of these nights uh, because... I read a little bit of your article and then knowing that we were talking about uh, Scorpius uh, today, I pulled out Webb's uh, celestial objects for common telescopes. And, and you have a very common telescope. The, the very. refractor is about the most common telescope I think you can get. That's right. And his write-up of Antares is, is kind of interesting. Um, do you mind if I just Yeah, read you go a for it. I, I looked at it, but I didn't read it. So this great star justly terms fiery red, and it is a grand telescopic object. Its tint, however, is not uniform. To me, the disk appears with flashes of deep crimson alternating with a less proportion of fine green. Yeah. The latter mixture, perhaps accounted for by the seven magnitude star near enough to be usually involved in the flaming rays of the principal, forming an atmospheric rather than optical test, which I thought, gee, that sounds quite interesting. Hmm. That last part was me, not him. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, I, I thought you were, you were responsible for the whole waxing eloquent there. Uh, no, no. So I've seen, I've seen it as he describes, actually. I mean, oddly, I, I could have written a much less eloquent, but a similar observing report where I've actually seen that green uh, flashiness to it. Um, we spent a summer once trying to observe the, the companion, uh, from Ontario, we're at 43 degrees, uh, latitude. So we can just see the whole constellation. And I remember just being like awestruck because from Nova Scotia, you've got to get just into the right spot to see it. And I had that spot, uh, approximately a hundred feet from my back door, um, which I have to drive three miles to get to <laughs> because it's very <laughs> rough land. Um, but anyway, uh, I can just get it and I, I can't quite see the whole thing unless I get to the right spot and have the right night. But in Ontario, it's just high enough that you get enough nights where you can see the whole thing. Of course, a lot more light pollution there. And, uh, and, and I was not able to get it in my 80, uh, that I was observing with Norma five inch that I was observing with. And, uh, I could see that green flash. Um, but another observer, Clark. Uh, and he's a very good observer uh, and has a, has a 12 inch reflector and he just dedicated like the summer to it. And I think he got it on two or three occasions, but that's what he did with his summer, but he saw it. He did, he did say that he did eventually get the night where he could, he could see it. I'm not that committed to double stars though, <laughs> but I see Shane, it's actually 2.9. Arc seconds. And I think, didn't you say that the one that you were observing up in Cygnus that, that was a bit of a challenge was about 2.9 arc seconds? Yeah, it was two point, it was 2.8. It was 2. very 8. challenging, but, uh, you know, it, once, once the skies were steady enough, it was actually not that hard. Um, if you knew kind of where to look and what to look for. Um, however, I think with Antares being so bright, uh, this one might be a little more challenging. 
And then also the big caveat here is that it's so low on the horizon. And yes, yes. if you were struggling with something in Cygnus, which I think is virtually overhead or very high up, yes. um, and Terry's being right now only, I think maybe 15 or 16 degrees above our horizon, Max, it's going to be tough. Yeah. It's going to be yeah. really, really tough. You know what would be a good, good way to try for it right now, if you're going to try for this one, is at dusk. And yeah. Because Antares should jump out pretty quick. It's going to be a little bit higher, although it's going to be descending even even at dusk, and then and then just to stay on it. But I think that your best bet is if you don't get it this season is to wait until April, end of April, and then get on it in the mornings. But I know you you don't like to get up and observe in the morning. Well, because I'm I know you fall asleep after you know you do your thirty minutes of of whatever uh, observing in the morning. Yeah. Once I'm up, I'm up. I yeah. I don't fall asleep, so I turn into a train wreck. Yeah, I'm kind of the opposite. Like once I observe, like to me, observing is almost like meditation, I suppose. And and meditation is everybody. I will meditate from time to time as well. Um, and I do sleep better after I meditate. I haven't been meditating this year, but. <laughs> with all the craziness with the pandemic, maybe it would, would lower my stress. Although the astronomy really does help. And uh, yeah, I find I sleep really well after I observe. So much so that I almost like just can't even wake up. Like today, I observed from just about four until uh, just about five. And I went back to bed and boy, I slept right through until like 9.30. So I'm super well rested now. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> pretty crazy um and i remember a couple of years ago i went and did a did a solo session and i had kind of okay conditions okay enough to observe and i did like four or five hours uh went to bed at two and i was camping and, you know it can be hard to sleep when you're camping i went to bed at like 1 30 or 2 i was asleep by 2 anyway and i woke up at 10 so <laughs> wow. i woke up and it was warm in my tent but i camped in a shady spot and i was like whoa like that is some um, heavy sleep for for camping so but that was after i bought the the new map that we talked about last week so nice. all right moving on moving on from antares antares is of course the big brightest red star and it's it's near the ecliptic so the planets come nearby that's why it's referred to as the uh, rival of mars of course this year mars is nowhere near antares it is in very high in the uh sort of in the autumn sky. That's why I'm getting up in the morning to take a look. But if we go about a degree and a half east, we get to M4. So what, what is M4, Shane? What does M4 mean to you? <laughs> so any, the, any uh, object beginning with the M designation is a Messier object. Uh, I think we've talked a little bit about Messier objects. It's, uh, it's a list formed by an, uh, an astronomer of many, many years ago. Uh, Stay Charles. tuned for the March episode on messy objects. <laughs> yeah, coming you, you in nine months. Yes, uh, for the for the Messier marathon. <laughs> um, but Charles Messier, you know, attempted or his his goal was to discover a whole bunch of comets, um, and he scanned the sky very methodically. And as he came across like a fuzzy object, he would record its position and then he would come back to it many nights later to see if it changed its position amongst the background stars if it changed its position he had discovered a comet but what he became famous for was all of his non-comet discoveries because they're some of the brightest objects in the sky uh, galaxies nebulas um, clusters uh, his telescope though wasn't you know it, it was a very modest telescope and wasn't able to resolve a lot of these fuzzy objects into what we kind of know them as today um, so many astronomers getting into the hobby will start off uh, trying to observe all of the objects on the messier list because again they're the brightest and largest and i shouldn't say the brightest and largest in the sky but you know it comprises of a lot of those big bright objects yeah that's one way to put it. Um, you know, I've been to where he did his observing. Did I ever tell you that? I've been to the, he observed at a place called the Hotel de Cluny in yeah. Paris, in France. Yeah, you did mention that, yeah. So before, in fact, right before I moved to Saskatchewan 10 years ago, that's where I was. I went from Ontario to Paris and stayed there for a few weeks and then moved to Saskatchewan. So 
<laughs> interesting mix of of cultures um but yeah it it's a neat place they don't think of Messier in too high regard at the Hotel de Cluny um, because he's very practically minded. And the Hotel de Cluny um, is most uh, prominently known as as an ancient Roman bath Hmm. that they built built onto. Yeah, so you can go down and and see the the ancient Roman bath down down below. Uh, There's very little there on, on the history of Charles Messier at the Hotel de Cluny. Kind of, in a way, kind of disappointing, in a way, fascinating. Um, because you, you walk up and one of the first things you see is this turret. And of course, I know that on that turret is where that he had his observatory. And on the side of the turret that he would uh, ascend each night to do his observations are um, like all these huge astronomical uh, measuring tools and, um, you know, kind of like uh, sundial type things, but he was using them for different measurements, um, which I took tons of photos of and I, I, I have somewhere. Um, but they, they don't really know what the true purpose was, but they're not very pleased. Like he drilled into the side of the building, he made <laughs> some other modifications to it. And really, you know, and he's, he's doing this in the late 1700s around the turn of the, uh, you know, 1700s to, to 1800s. And that is very recent history in, uh, European history, right? Like in, in yeah. Canada, we'd see that as kind of like, in a way, like, um, you know, somewhat older history, perhaps, because uh, uh, just because of the nature of our country here, of, uh, although, you know, people have been looking at the skies here for 12,000 years, um, you know, in Europe, they see that as sort of desecrating this historical uh, landmark, uh, really is, is kind of the gist. Because I did ask, uh, the folks there in, in my rather poor French. And, uh, and that's kind of sort of the, the lowdown they gave me. But I was kind of able to go up and sort of as much as possible trace his steps up to, to the top of the turret and kind of go around and give myself my own little, little tour, which was kind of neat. Um, but Messier 4 is this globular cluster, which is really compact and globular, and, uh, and it's really easy to find. So on a, on a good night, if you go out, you can find uh, Antares. If you need to know where to find Antares, you can go to skymaps.com and just download the free sky map. It's going to be in the bottom right by the south uh, for the uh, July or August sky charts. And uh, right beside it, M4 is marked. And you can actually see it pretty well in binoculars. Pretty easy binocular item to see, eh? Yeah, yeah, that one really jumps out. It's uh, it's it's a nice part of the sky. You know, it's close to the Milky Way in Sagittarius. It, if you're If you're panning through Sagittarius, just go to the right and keep looking. Mm. There, there's some other more challenging objects there, like, and, and this is one of the challenges that, that I think we have when we're explaining astronomy and, and looking at stuff through the, through the optics uh, with the eye versus um, the beautiful photographs people see. So if people see a photograph of the Antares region, they're going to notice that there's all this really uh, bright nebulosity in the photograph. There's dark lanes and it, you know, all these different, almost seems like every color rainbow, you have like orange and purple and yellow and blue and dark colors and smoky colors and reds and all that. But when you look through the banana, you see nothing. <laughs> like it's, you're going to see some stars in M4. That's it. And if you have a really good telescope and a really good night, you might kind of think you're seeing some of the other, some of the other nebula. And I'm not going to get into all those, but you kind of have to be prepared uh, for what, going to actually see. But M4, I think, is the easiest to see. But sort of moving moving on from there, if you draw a line halfway, uh, or if you go on a line halfway from Antares to Graphius, which is Betasco, which is just about 10 degrees to the northwest from Antares, uh, halfway along this line, you're going to find uh, Messier 80, which is a really tight, concentrated um, globular cluster as well. So another globular cluster. And you know, Shane, there's a really neat thing. You were talking about reading in Webb's book, which uh, I think I turned you on to getting Webb's book, which is a great yep. uh, book, Webb's uh, Objects for, what's it called? Celestial Objects for Common Telescopes? Yes. Two editions. The pink one is for planets. Get it? Pink for planets. Oh. And then there's the blue sneaky. one for deep sky. And <laughs> Webb wrote these, uh, I think over like a or so years ago they're excellent they were reissued in the 60s i think that's where most of the copies there's tons of copies 
really easy to get from the 60s. But then there's also the Bedford catalog, which isn't put together by Bedford. It's put together by Admiral Smythe, of course, um, which I like a little bit better. Do you have the Bedford catalog? I do not. You should get the, another Wilman Bell book. You should get the Bedford catalog. It's really good. So I was reading in the Bedford catalog about Messier 80 or M80, the globular cluster, because really through most telescopes that I've looked through, except for like some fairly large telescopes, Messier 80 really just looks like a bright concentration. And it's bright. It's seventh magnitude. Can't see it with the unaided eye, but you can see it. Looks like a fuzzy star through binoculars. Looks like a slightly larger, fuzzier star through a five inch refractor, for example. Uh, and even through like an eight inch telescope, 12 inch telescope, maybe you can start to see some stars. Um, it's tightly concentrated. Um, and it's in this area that is sort of um, free. It's like sort of, it, it's sitting in an area that's like a bit of a window, but it, I think it's sitting in front of some dark nebula. And when uh, William Herschel um, was observing what he would do, and William Herschel was a, uh, uh, you know, an 18th and 19th century visual observer who discovered many of the NGC and deep sky objects. Um, he would just sort of point his telescope at the sky and then just catalog things as they drip it through the eyepiece. Um, and when he discovered um, some of the other nebulas that are, that are around Antares and around M80, um, he was looking at M80 and then kind of as it drifted out of the field, there's some dark areas. And then often the dark areas precede the bright areas according to Wright Ascension and how they would drift through his field of view. So he would like holler out, and in this case he like hollered out after observing M80, all right, here comes some more nebulae because you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna be seeing uh, some bright nebula after these sort of darker regions pass of which there's, there's not many stars. So it's kind of neat. Yeah. There's also some bright, really good double stars. This, this one, um, this is a V or new SCO, um, which is just to the, uh, let's see, just to the north of Graphius is V SCO, or it's like the Greek letter, looks like a little V. And, and it is a 14 arc second. So that is gonna be an easy split for your telescope and it's a blue white double. Now, Ooh. if you actually read some of the details on this in software or whatever, and this is one thing I noticed, there's a lot of errors that are out there in the, uh, in the softwares that you can get. So in my Sky Safari, I think, and in some other sources, it says it's a challenging split, but 14 arc seconds, that's not challenging, even relatively low, is it? No, no, that's not too bad at all. I think Polaris, uh, so the North Star, that's a double system. And I want to say that that's 18 arc seconds. Mm. And it appears kind of tight, but once you see the companion, um, you know, a 60 millimeter telescope with low magnification will easily separate it. Yeah. And this uh, Visco, this is going to be your new SCO. This is going to be your double double for... Mm -hmm for Scorpius. And uh, there's also, um, I think another double double there. It's the, uh, oh, not Epsilon, but anyway, it, it's uh, relatively nearby to that star. And then there's 11 SCO, which is in the same general area. And it's a fifth magnitude uh, double star as well. So there's all kinds of double stars uh, up there. Oh. If you get, uh, you were talking about the double star uh, catalog from Wilman Bell that, that Brian Skiff and Will Tiram put out, um, you know, that would be a good source if people are actually looking to split some doubles. But if you go to South, um, there's SU SCO, which is an eighth magnitude variable carbon star. And it's about uh, halfway between Tau and Epsilon SCO, just, uh, just to the South there. Uh, sort of uh, south of Antares. You know, and, and you and I talked about how we used to think double stars were boring. Why would anyone want to observe them? And now we're, you know, I've certainly found a passion for them and I think you're finding uh, some interest in them as well. Yeah. I used to think the same thing about carbon stars. Why observe a star? Uh, until I think last year, I really had my first observation of a carbon star up in uh, Cassiopeia. Oh, really? Yeah. And man, that was fun. And yeah. you know, the, 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 
the vibrant red of the carbon star was just fascinating. So I'm, I'm, I'm more intrigued to observe those as well now. Yeah, the first carbon star I ever observed, I, I think I observed by accident, um, and it's one of the best ones, is up in uh, Lupus, the hair, which is just below uh, Orion. And we were observing in the spring, I think like an April night or something, and, uh, and I just happened across it while I was sort of in the area looking at like M79 or something. And I could not get over how red it was. And I, I don't, I probably had heard of carbon stars, but I never hunted one down and purposely looked at one. I hadn't that night either. And I, and I showed it to a couple of people and someone said, well, that's probably a carbon star. In fact, they were pretty sure it was. So then I looked it up and sort of observed that. And then I came to find out that there's really not that many a good observable carbon stars. And I, I did notice because of the variability, um, once they're, they're bright enough, they don't appear as red. It's only a, during a certain point where they, they will appear quite red uh, to the eye. Uh, they have to be still, they have to be bright enough, uh, but not too bright and then not too faint either. Otherwise they just look like a faint star. So, so there's sort of this fine line when you actually do get that uh, blood red deep, you know, like this red that we saw that night, well, I had a red car and I would say that like it was the same red as my car was maybe even just a little bit deeper red than that. Um, anyway, very neat. To yeah. See. Of all the colors you can see in a star, there's nothing like a carbon star uh, in terms mm. of its vibrancy and, and just how, how much red you see. They're, they're incredible. Yeah. And if you keep going down like to the very bottom of the tail now, unfortunately, uh, this is where you get cut off <laughs> because, <laughs> because once you get much below this uh, carbon star and, and it's, this carbon star is bright enough that you, you can see it from 50 degrees latitude. Uh, but really once you get a few degrees further south and we're, we're going to go about seven or eight degrees further south still, uh, we get to our horizon. <laughs> so, and then that's, that's sort of game over for us. Uh, but from uh, Southern Ontario or from very Southern Nova Scotia, you can actually see uh, NGC 6231, otherwise known as the false comet. And this is a very bright 2.6 magnitude open cluster. And you can actually see it with the unaided eye uh, if you have a very dark site with uh, true dark horizons. I'm not sure where in Ontario you could get it. I, 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 I discovered it <laughs> very, very late, very late, um, you know, after probably hundreds of other observers. But when, uh, when I got to Ontario and, and I, I, you know, had, uh, had some better horizons there than I had in my observing sites in, in Nova Scotia, um, I, could, uh, I could see that lower part of the tail finally. And I thought, man, wouldn't it be great if there was like a cluster down there? And man, there is a cluster down there and it is bright. And so I was able to nail that with, with binoculars and found out that it was this NGC 6231. So that's when I, I sort of moved around and, uh, and found a site really close to my my home uh, in Nova Scotia when I go back there and can actually see it from that that spot on really really good nights. But man, you need a you need good nights to to see it from Canada. Uh, there's no doubt. And there's actually so when I was down there, this is in uh, 2017, just over three years ago, and I just had gotten the 60 millimeter telescope and I took my UHC filter with me and my 30 millimeter eyepiece. And I was able to see the Prawn Nebula, which is just uh, just a little bit above and to the east of NGC 6231. Um, at least that's what I thought I was observing. I mean, it looked like a fuzzy spot in the right spot. I wasn't really necessarily thinking I was gonna get a nebula in the area. I just brought the filter with me. And then uh, with that little scope on, what I would say is a perfect night from a magnitude 6364 site. Uh, I was able to get it in the 60, although I couldn't really find like small instrument observations uh, of that nebula. So I don't know, maybe, maybe I just thought I saw it or something, but it certainly did seem like I got a fuzzy spot and that fuzzy spot certainly did seem to improve with the, uh, with the UHC filter on what I consider to be one of the best nights that I've ever had. So who knows? Interesting. You know, and another interesting thing is, so uh, 6231 you said is also known as the false comet false comet yeah so in webb's uh book m80 he begins his description with 
it's like a comet, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Well, that, you know, and I, and I read that, and I, I think that might be in um, the Bedford catalog as well. That's mm-hmm. actually not, um, that's actually not Webb's observation. He didn't credit it, but um, oh. that was Messi's discovery observation of it. And, it, and I think they just missed the quotes because word for word, what, what uh, Webb has in there is, is from the Messier uh, description. So, okay. Okay. yeah, I have the, I actually have Messier's um, PDF somewhere, but I also have um, the Glenn Jones book on uh, Messier, which is a little bit more accurate historically than, than some of the other texts. So, yeah, that's where that one, that's where that came from is, so Messier was, as you mentioned earlier, was really comparing the, uh, the comets to, to other things. And then it was Herschel, William Herschel, that talked about how concentrated um, it was, uh, even through larger instruments and difficult to, to resolve. So, so that's why, why it does, a, does appear that way. But yeah, I noticed that sometimes in those secondary sources that sometimes they will, uh, they're, they're just misquoting, like those are pretty ancient works in, in, in a way being, uh, you know, the better part of, of 150 years old. So I think sometimes somewhere along the way, I think some of the quotation marks get dropped is the only oh, yeah. thing I, the only thing I can imagine because I think like Webb and uh, Smythe were really trying to be pretty accurate and giving the right uh, credit to, to the right observers. So not really sure what happened there with those. I think somewhere along the lines, cause my works often get edited too, not that there are any significance like, like Messier or, or Herschel. Um, but, uh, but sometimes that can happen as well. Like in this recent one, um, I talk about the, you know, the 5.5 to 7 magnitude companion of, of Antares and they were editing it. So they put hyphens in and a hyphen landed just before the 5.5 and then it got, (laughs) so suddenly you have a negative 5.5 companion to Antares, right? That changes Um, things. Yeah, so I kind of had to write back and say, well, I think we better take that hyphen out of there, you know? So yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah, be careful not to put the hyphens before um, your magnitudes. Uh, you know, you kind of have to have to watch out for, for the editors there because they often don't know, right? Like the editors often don't know. And sometimes people think, well, it's just a description or whatever, right? Um, then... Uh, you know, th- then you can sometimes lose that, that context. But yeah, when I was reading through, because I do, do read through the uh, Celestial Objects for Common Telescopes and the Smythe as well, um, I did notice that, that they had uh, dropped the, the quotes um, and the reference to, to Messi in that for whatever reason. I don't know. But yeah, it was kind of funny because that is, that's like his description, like word for word. So, uh, and if you're far enough south, one last thing you can see is Sargus, which is a really bright star, one of the 50th in the sky, one of the 50 brightest in the sky. And it's a 1.9 magnitude horizon hugging uh, star, but it's also a double. It's fifth magnitude and it's separated by 6.5 arc seconds. So it's pretty close. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're gonna have to be, you're gonna have to be further south. But it can be worthwhile. Like if you think about it, when we go down to the grass sands, we're right at 49. So we've, and we, we dog lag when we go down there pretty bad. Um, but if you just drove straight down the six, you'd cross the border, which is right at 49. And then, um, you know, if you go another, you know, four or 500 kilometers, you're going to start getting far enough south. And I actually think that the atmospheric conditions in, uh, in Western North America are a little bit better. So you probably just have to get uh, another three or four degrees further south than that uh, than that border um, sometime you know mid may to to early june time frame and uh, you know you're going to you're going to be able to to make some of these observations Shane, and and hopefully we can do that uh, next may when you know hopefully the borders open long before then but if you're if you're too far south um, you can go up you know which star shola is though do you know which one shola is not offhand, no. So Shoal is one of those stars that um, it's two, it's, well, it's like two stars, but they're very, very far apart. Um, and they form the stinger, kind of like the tail kind of goes up and then the stinger oh, kind of goes yeah. back. 
And those, like I knew when I, I knew if you didn't know up a name, you'd know when I described it because yeah. we do see those stars and they sit fairly high above our horizon here, uh, probably about five degrees. And uh, they're sometimes referred to as the cat's eyes, which I never really thought that much of before. But when I moved out here and I lost the other part of the tail and these stars are, are much closer to the horizon, I think the angle is a little bit better here. Um, they do kind of look like cat's eyes kind of peering back at you over the, over the horizon. Quite like so they're that. really close to uh, like M6, M7? That's right, yeah. And I mean, that's kind of where we're going from here. So if we, if we continue on and go about five degrees northeast, of uh, the cat's eyes or Shola, uh, you're going to get to to M7. So what is M7 since you mentioned it? Uh, another cluster. I think that one's an open cluster. Yeah, it's an open cluster and it's called Ptolemy's Cluster after the observer who, who wrote about it in his El Majest in about 130 uh, AD. And he wrote that it's following the sting of Scorpius and it is misty at least according to my, my copy of the Alma Jest. And, uh, you know, back uh, long ago, you know, before the telescope was, was pointed skyward and before the invention of the telescope, um, they would see early observers and, and early peoples, you know, going back thousands of years, of course, would see these sort of fuzzy or hazy or cloudy spots in the sky, and, uh, and they would take note of them. Um, and then, you know, as time, as time went on and, and catalogs were, were being created, uh, some of these uh, sort of more prominent ones or, or ones that were in, uh, you know, significant areas of the sky um, would make their way into catalogs. So, you know, Ptolemy was not the first person to observe this, but he was the first person to actually, I think, place it in, into, uh, you know, a written catalog. And of course, you know, publish or perish kind of thing applies to the annals of history as well. Um, and, and as such, you know, uh, perhaps one of the reasons why this one and maybe not other sort of fuzzy spots made, made the way in is because it was almost like that's where the sky was stung by the stinger being so close to, to the stinger. Hmm. Uh, that's, uh, I love those stories of how people have perceived the sky and the interactions of the constellations like that is, is fascinating. I love the stories. And, you know, um, sometimes the modern observing, and this is like, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm not just sort of making a random point. Uh, sometimes the modern observing and the application of better instruments actually can muddy the waters. Um, and, and this happened in, in this region. And I think it was in the 60s, they were doing this uh, sky survey with a, a big Schmidt camera. And back in the uh, late 1800s, John Herschel was observing um, in South Africa and he discovered uh, a large star cloud uh, that M7 uh, sort of bordered on. And you can see this with the unaided eye. We, we've seen this from, from grasslands, even low down. It's very bright. And it's uh, almost like a perfect one degree circle right beside M7. It's a little bit fainter than M7. Once you can see, you know, when we see that super fine detailed structure of the Milky Way from down there in the pure dark sky, yep. once you get into that kind of sky, you can start to, to see, uh, to see this, this object. And John Herschel cataloged it as NGC 6455 and described it as a very intense nebulous clustering mass. The stars are of excessive smallness and infinite in number. but uh, when, when, when they started actually uh, doing like the sort of proper scientific catalog in the, in the 60s with the Schmidt camera um, and they came upon it, uh, they didn't get anything because that camera really wasn't designed uh, for wide field uh, Milky Way cloud observations or, or imaging. And so they didn't really see anything there. But there are some other clusters there. and it's sort of erroneously been associated with uh, another cluster in the area, which is like a small tight little cluster. Uh, but that's not what Herschel uh, discovered. He discovered uh, 6455, 6455 is this, this fairly large uh, star cloud in Sagittarius. So, so sometimes, you know, the modern observing can, can get in the way of, of even the simplest observing because to the unaided eye, and, and how I kind of came upon this was uh, one of our first sessions down there. 
I saw this and I went, what, what is that bright object right next to uh, M7? You know, once you're dark enough that, that you can really see M7 as such a bright thing, you see this thing uh, sort of hanging off the, the side of it. Um, and I thought, well, that's got to be something. And it turns out it is, but it, but it's, you know, mis, uh, miscategorized. So if you look up NGC 6455 in most, um, in most works, uh, it's actually referenced as this tiny little cluster. With the exception of Sue French, uh, in her book, Deep Sky Wonder, she correctly uh, IDs it. And she talks about a little bit more about the, uh, the survey they were doing with the Schmidt camera. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. And just above it, we have M6, which is the butterfly cluster, which is another large open cluster. And, and you can get them both together in like a really wide field telescope or a good pair of binoculars. They'll both fit. Very cool. Yeah. So I'll mention just a few more things. Um, just to the northeast of M6 is the Tom Thumb cluster, which is just a little uh, cluster. And David Levy talks about it in his, in his book, Deep Sky Gems. And that cluster, uh, although I think it looks like a triangle or something through a larger telescope, um, but it, it, it is the closest deep sky object, apparently, according to David Levy, good source, uh, it's the closest deep sky object you can see with an amateur telescope um, to the center of our Milky Way. Huh. So, you know, I never knew that. That's, that's another <laughs> interesting thing. Yeah, I think it's about I think it's about two degrees away from the true center. I didn't put it in my article because I'm not sure how accurate that is. I feel like it's a little bit further, so I'm just kind of leaving it at that. I think it is probably the I mean, I shouldn't say it's the closest, easiest thing to see. So I'm kind of I'm being a little bit nebulous in my description of that. Oh, <laughs> I see what you did. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that happened to me, I when I was, I really got obsessed with binoculars and and. Uh, this was some time ago. I bought a pair of 22 by 100 binoculars. And they uh, wow. probably work more like a 20 by 80 in, in reality. But regardless, they had a, have about a three degree field of view. I still have them. I got them for $100, right? They're, they're really good $100 binoculars. So if you're losing 15 or 20% of the, of the light collecting, you're, you're really not missing that much. And I think they, they look pretty cool too. Um, so I got these big binoculars and I was so excited and I went down to our observing site and I got them set up and I, I didn't have a proper mount for them at the time. And I, uh, I ended up pointing them pretty low. I could only go low on the horizon cause I just had a tripod, really inexpensive tripod to put them on. Um, and so I'm, I'm only going to be looking pretty much straight out and not, not too high up. So just anything below about, you know, like M24, Messier 24, Sagittarius star cloud and down. And I thought, well, that's great. Cause I'll sweep down from there and kind of go across into, into Scorpius. And I hadn't really pointed them before. And I remember I was really tired that night. And I thought first thing I'm going to look at is um, the Lagoon Nebula and M20, M21 area, right? You, you know that area pretty well. Yep. 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 So you kind of know what it looks like through, and I had an 80 millimeter telescope at the time, which I'd spent a lot of time looking at this area. And with, with binoculars, even though these are hundred million binoculars working in 80, um, the, the perception of things through binoculars, as you know, Shane is much larger, right? Like things just have a different image scale altogether. Right. Yeah. When you use two eyes, it, everything's very different. Yeah, and so I looked at a few things from the yard. So I'm really excited to finally get out to, to the dark skies. And I point, and I guess I didn't quite, because I think they have a 2.8 or 2.9 degree field of view. And still like getting used to pointing them and I don't have them on a good mount. And I, I kind of missed M, uh, M8 and M21. So I have to pan around. And like I said, they, they weren't well balanced. They're not well mounted. And they tended to sink, and I'm struggling to use them on this really. So it was almost like a plastic tripod, right? It was like worst pause. And it's like a, they're like a 10 or 11 pound binocular, right? They're metal and heavy as hell. And anyway, and so finally I got on M8 and M2021. And I, oh man, I was so disappointed. 
and uh, they just didn't look like much. And I was like, man, there's something wrong with these binoculars. And it seemed like they were reversed or something because M20 and 21 should be to the right of Messier 8 or Lagoon Nebula. And the lagoon just wasn't bright at all. I could hardly see the nebulosity. But I pulled away and I was like, well, wait a second, I'm, I'm nowhere near it. I, I had drifted down, right? And sort of my confusion and my lack of experience with this instrument on a poor mount, I had drifted down from being uh, just barely north uh, west of Sagittarius to being uh, sort of between the Stinger and an Antares somewhere. So pretty far down into, into Scorpius, sort of in, into the uh, eastern area of Scorpius. And I was like, well, what am I looking at? So I didn't know uh, like at all what I was looking at, but I could see like some, some star chains and some nebulae and uh, stuff like that. And it turns out that I was looking at uh, NGC 6334, the cat's paw, and NGC 6357, the lobster nebula, which is, which is great when you're observing the lobster nebula from Nova Scotia, <laughs> where lots of lobster come from. Uh, through these 100 millimeter binoculars. So I was like really like blown away that I, I was able to pull that in. And like, as we said, the uh, binoculars, they change the image scale, they change the way things look. And, uh, you know, a, a hundred or close to a hundred millimeter binocular really, really can pull in an awful lot of light. Yeah. So we have the prawn nebula, the lobster, all in Scorpius. We have a lot of exoskeleton activity in that part of the sky. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. <laughs> yuck, yuck. <laughs> wow. Well, that's yeah, a stinger. There, oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> I always have to mention, I did get stung by a scorpion when I was sleeping in an old wine press, or an olive press, not a wine press. I was sleeping in an old olive press in Tuscany. So that always is kind of like, yeah, it's not great. Don't recommend it. These, these are just the, the, sort of house scorpions i call them they're not like the the big giant thick tail scorpions but anyway so that's sort of uh i think our adventure for a deep dive our first deep dive i'm not sure how the rest of them are going to look but yeah. uh, you know one of the things i always i always do start a little bit with kind of getting these together at this time of year um for whatever reason so Maybe maybe it'll prompt me to get a, a little bit a little bit more organized and kind of get them together. But I think this is my eighth one that I've done for the handbook. So, well, I think this has been really good. Um, yeah, certainly explains Scorpius to everybody listening and myself. And um, you know, good point about missing the opportunity this year, likely to observe it. But yeah, um, it's if good people to are think further a little bit south, ahead. Though. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that was sort of one of my things, and it is sort of often seen as more of a summer type constellation, um, and it's certainly high enough to kind of see in Terry's and and they, if if people haven't observed it before, it kind of raised their attention. If they are further north, like we are, and if they're further than uh, if they're further south than forty five degrees north latitude, um, you know, basically, you know, mid U S states or lower. Then, uh, then people can see it can see it fairly well even still. And and I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier or not, but Scorpius really looks like its namesake. It kind of does look like a scorpion. I I think anyway. Yeah, I I agree. Yeah, it's one of the few ones. And so same with Orion, that it's sort of uh, uh, sort of sistered with in, in the sky. Those those two are among the the two that look most like um, their namesakes. Yeah, yeah. A lot of bright stars help form, you know, the basic outline, I guess, of the constellation. And it really helps you to visualize what it's depicting. Yeah. Well, do you have anything to add about Scorpius, the scorpion chain? Not at all. You did a great job to <laughs> take us into the deep dive of various things to, to look at and some of the history with it. So I feel like we... We need a sound effect for this. We need like if we're gonna if we're gonna do so many of these and and I'm gonna if I'm volunteering to do this, I might I might put you on to making a sound effect that's like deep dive and then would have like a splash or something. Yeah, I'll work on that. <laughs> work on that, okay. All right. Or maybe I can I can contract my cousin Will through through the magic of the internet and and maybe some sort of beer gift certificate to make us uh to make us a wave file. <laughs> 
Right on. All right. Well, thanks so much, Shane. Yeah. Thank you to everybody for listening. All right.